Seth Soloway. I'm the director of the Performing Arts Center at Purchase College, as evidenced by my t-shirt. We're all doing the, uh, the at-home thing here, and so um, we're glad for you to join us in our uh, PAC in your living room series, and I'm lucky to be joined today by uh, Purchase alum and one of our favorite collaborators, Kyle Abraham. Um, and Kyle is coming to us from California, and he is going to um, be kind enough to answer about a dozen questions that we pulled um, off of a survey that we sent to students, to faculty, to staff, and also to our general patronage. Um, so please look out for those as we go forward. We're going to do a series of these interviews with our artists, and we'd love to have the questions come, uh, come to many of you as possible. So, Kyle, uh, I'm going to start with um, some questions that relate to the moment that we're in. Um, so the first one is, um, uh, are you able to, or how do you plan to use this extra time and space and isolation to think about um, future works? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it's a great question. I think the struggle for me is, as someone who's been so immersed in the administrative world as well as the artistic world, um, I'm still working, it seems like, just as much, if not more. Um, so I haven't really had as much time as I'd like. Um, I think the struggle for someone like me is to use the weekends to actually try to totally decompress and go away from the work as much as I can and just try and be present um, because that can be a real challenge, especially in these times. Like how can you really just, especially when you're alone, like I am, I'm not, I don't live with anyone else. Um, so it, it's just a, it's a different conversation that I'm having to have with myself. Um, but a lot of the works um, for me have been kind of planned out for several years. So um, I'm trying to make myself take the space to um, do a little bit more research on um, some of the mythologies and folklores that are connected to a project that I'm doing for 2021. Um, I'm trying to um, use the time to talk with the dancers. Our rehearsals at the moment um, aren't always movement driven, they're um, conversations. So thinking about different conversation starters that fall in line with the work that we did a, a avant premiere with um, at the purchase uh, back, back in December. So talking to him about that work, talking about really love and relationships, um, that's been really important um, for me to have those conversations. Um, but yeah, it's hard to really settle and sit still in that way. Um, if I can go on a walk um, away from people, I... Uh, Socially distance. <laughs> yeah, I try, yeah, definitely. I definitely keep my distance. I, um, I try and go on the walks with the music um, in my mind that I want to use for a project. I have a couple of ballets that I have to make, uh, or that I've uh, commissioned to make over the next two years. So just kind of going over a playlist in my mind, um, it's been a thing that I'm trying to do. Um, trying to also get better at kind of trying to dedicate um, each day for a different project. So I will only think about an untitled love on Mondays. And then I'll go to a ballet I'm making for Leon Opera Ballet on Tuesdays. And kind of just try and treat it like that. But to be honest, I haven't done that yet. That's my, that's my goal. So these, are your, these are your goals for as this go forward. And do you think that's because like many of us, you know, we came into this not knowing how long this was going to be. And now it's already, I mean, we're actually a month to the day um, that we um, really started to cancel our live events, um, which just feels so uh, surreal to me. And I hear you about the weekend thing. I feel like we're, we're working more. It's, it's hard to shut off on the weekend. Yeah. And being here on the West Coast right now, it's like I'm, I'm waking up trying to make sure that I answer my East Coast emails before my East Coast meetings start. Um, wow. Like that's a whole thing. Um, my first meetings will happen around 8 a.m. for me. But then when it's 3, East Coast people are finished with work because it's 6 o'clock for you. But I'm like, well, I should probably do a couple more emails. <laughs> but I've been working since 8, and a lot of times not getting like, it's like, okay, I have to make sure that I stop to eat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so just with components. But yeah, I think the, the question you're just asking about like this timeline is just, um, it's been really precarious for me because I gave up my apartment in New York right um, right after our engagement. Yeah, when you were with us. Uh, yeah, um, I actually was putting things in storage while I was at purchase. <laughs> uh, and then in LA, I don't have a place in LA either. Um, when I teach, I 
tend to just rent um, something for a period of months. And so the week that everything really kind of blew up in a certain way, um, I was on my way back to New York um, to look for an apartment to rent for the year. Um, so that's all on hold. And I initially did like an Airbnb for 10 days thinking, oh, well, I mean, I'll figure it out in 10 days. I'm sure yeah, I'll figure it out. Or... <laughs> that didn't happen. So then I moved into a sublet that I'm renting month to month at the moment. Well, we're glad you're, you're safe and well there. Um, so you talked about um, rehearsing in this environment. And so one of the questions speaks to that, asking about um, dance companies, of course, as you know, most collaborative arts are dependent upon working together and rehearsing as a group physically in the same space. So um, how is the company staying connected and how are you continuing to conduct rehearsals and such um, via Zoom? Yeah. Um... I, to be really honest, I'm, I mean, the same thing would probably apply for me in rehearsal anyway. I, I'm less interested in um, moving with them in Zoom in that kind of way. Like I'm not, that's not um, pushing the work forward for me at this point, um, especially as someone who generates a lot of material on my own and gives a lot of prompts for my collaborators to generate material and or vary that material. Um, at a certain point, there's just too much. And then when we're back in the space together, there will be too much to be choosing from that I will just kind of <laughs> cower and want to go hide in a corner. Um, so what we do is, is um, now once a week, we, I, I, uh, I pick a film that's related to the work. Um, I ask them to watch it. It's part of their, like, I mean, granted, they're salaried employees, but uh, like an hour that you may be factoring in, maybe it's a two hour film, three hour film, um, and still factored into the day. And then we go into discussion shortly after that uh, for maybe two hours, talking about the film and how it relates to the work that we're making. Um, so that's what we've been doing the last however many weeks. Um, and I think that keeps shifting uh, in terms of how we're approaching um, this idea of rehearsal. Um, I, I want to touch on, because um, actually, you know, from an arts management perspective, it's so interesting to me is I've had so many um, heartbreaking phone calls with artists and with agents and really with everyone during this time about, you know, what are we all going to do? Um, I think it's important to point out something that you just touched on and probe a little bit, which is, you know, you have... I, I don't claim to be an expert on how dance companies are composed, but in my experience working with dance companies, um, your financial model is pretty unique. And that the dance, as you said, are on salary. Um, and I've spoken to so many companies who had to lay the dancers off. Um, so what a wonderful thing it is that everyone is still together, still employed, still working towards the, the great artistic goals of the company. Um, but I imagine that model's been hard to fight for, but it's rewarding now. Can you touch on that a little bit? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's certainly, it's certainly tricky knowing that, like, you know, they're really, we're only meeting twice a week but their salary, so they're gonna get their regular salary um, throughout this time. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a complicated thing for you know, everyone to be fighting for because I can't go forward, but it doesn't mean that people don't have um, bills to pay and food that they need to be eating. Um, so I wanna respect that and make sure that they feel taken care of because that's a major part of what um, my position in the company was always to be. Um, even though it's more on the artistic side for me. But the whole point of like making work and collaborating with people in any aspect of life is, has to do with trust. So if people don't feel trusted and supported, there's no way that they can do their best and be their best. And I'm not doing what I do to get something from someone. Um, but ideally people, um, there's very little that we can do in these days and times to make, make people feel safe. Um, so I think trying to keep some kind of normalcy, if in any way possible, is helpful. Um, but when it comes to just like having people get up and dance, I, I, that's not where I personally am at. I, sure. I know some companies who are having company class every day, but we weren't doing that before, so. Right, not your model, but I just had to mention it because it's just, it's so beautiful that everyone is still employed and taken care of and together. And I think that it'll make a difference in the work when this buzz comes back. And when yeah, I think, you know, I think one thing for people to consider is that, like, yeah, it's really terrible that the timeline of performances has shifted, 
But I think one thing that like it's kind of keeping me calm with this is that, okay, sure, um, a world premiere that was maybe supposed to happen in June has to shift to October. But in all reality, no one would be going into the theater once this is all cleared anyway for a period of time. So it, I, ideally, it gives uh, artists time to get back to the work in a timeline that still may be relative to the timeline that we would have had before, perhaps. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things, it's like, yeah, it, it's terrible, especially talking to visual arts friends of mine because of the way that the, the calendars are, are set up for them and schedules for them to be in a gallery and to do an install and all of that. It's, it's a whole different game. Um, but for me, this thing with like rehearsal, I need um, the tactility, I need yeah. proximity to address questions of community and love at this point. Um, I've done a lot of the other stuff before, so like now I need I need I need this to happen. <laughs> are, are you are you are you teaching remotely still? No, I ironically I finished um, my last class was on March sixteenth. Oh, think. very lucky. Yeah, yeah, I would. I would I'd probably have a breakdown and cry every time I had to do this. Like, actually, yeah, no. Well, that's where I was kind of going. If you were, because I know how tactile you are in the room, sort of, you know, how that would be. But ultimately, it's a wonderful thing and a lucky thing that you have to finish with those students. So, yeah, um, I think the sad thing was our our final assignments. Um, some of the students had to submit them um, online through video, and so they missed their peers seeing the progress that they made over the course of ten weeks. Yeah, we talked a lot about that at Purchase, too. It's heartbreaking. Um, all right, so I'm going to, um, uh, I have a couple of questions that are just about your, your general work and some of the, the, um, the press lately, and then a, a couple of Purchase-specific questions. I think I'll go to the work first. So, um, so one of our, um, uh, our uh, viewers wanted to know, um, in reference to the recent New York Times article, um, you were heard, um, uh, in the New York Times recently um, as um, a, a critical African-American artist shaping 21st century art. Um, and in the article, you spoke about um, D'Angelo and the, the piece uh, that we worked on at Purchase, um, Untitled Love, which is music inspired. Um, so what I wanted to know is how you went about drawing inspiration both um, from him and also from other artists in your general work while maintaining your own unique voice and vision. Sure, hello. A little gas bubble there. Um, yeah, I think. A good um, a little burp. Um, yeah, so I mean, the work that I make is always really, um, in some ways, uh, very much connected to my experience in my life. Um, I think one of the things that drew me into D'Angelo was really thinking about this timeline of uh, his music. Um, his first album coming out the first year that I was in college, and I went to a, a university. Um, before coming to purchase, and it was a an historically black college. That experience um, is layered in so many ways, um, but I ultimately went to that college to um, try and find a sense of unity that I didn't feel um, in my K through 12 uh, with uh, people that looked like me in some regard. Um, and it, it was a kind of ironic thing to be thinking about his album coming out at that time. Um, someone who made this music that was so soulful and um, it was a new sound, although it referenced a previous sound. Um, ironically, that album is one that I wind up listening to the majority of my time my freshman year at Purchase in 96. Um, but I, I think kind of diving a little bit closer to the question, things that came up for me were doing a lot of workshops and conversations, discussions with um, elders. Um, working a lot with um, people who knew my parents, both my parents are deceased, um, but people who worked with them either in the um, public schools or um, in their frater fraternities and sororities, bringing them all together to talk uh, with them and their partners about love, about um, hardships and triumphs in their relationships, um, and have them also tell me stories uh, about my parents, which was really great to hear and really special to have them share with me with that all in mind. Um, so this work, it has a bit of nostalgia in some ways because I'm thinking about my experience growing up around um, my parents who were really loving towards each other and towards me, but also their friends, like going to 
um, roller skating parties and just watching these um, older um, black couples in particular sharing love and dancing together, um, it, it brought me to this music all the more in, in a more nuanced way. Um, when I think of songs like um, Betray Your Heart or Prayer, there's, there's, this, uh, there's all these different things that I connect to in um, the Vanguard album, The Black Messiah. Um, there's a lot, there's darkness, but there's hope, which in some ways I'd like to think of this time that we're in now. It's, there is, of course, a darkness that we're living, living in, but there's a lot of, of hope as well. Um, and a lot of um, acknowledgement of love is, uh, I think, more of a driving force. So all of those things come up. And I think um, some of the conversations that I've been having with the dancers now have been really um, challenging the way in which I think about um, the ways in which not only I present love, but the ways in which I receive it. Um, so the work may have a massive about face <laughs> sometimes, or maybe I will, my first one. <laughs> maybe, you know, but that's what's interesting about this moment, right, is, I mean, being where we are now, it was so much more rewarding to have a piece um, that we felt a part of a purchase be just about love um, when you were with us in December, and now, yeah, the thought that it might eventually take some big turns, and, you know, the, the, the next iteration of the piece could be different. Um, it's, it's interesting in this moment. Yeah. Um, so while we're on music, there's a question here about um, The Runaway, which is the piece that's made in New York City Ballet. Um, and um, the, the person who wrote the question is asking about, um, uh, you know, the, the music again, the Kanye West music and thinking about um, the typical audience demographic for New York City Ballet and how they might interact with, with that. Was that a consideration for you or did you just make the piece you wanted to make because you knew it was the right piece to make for them? Sure, yeah, and for people that aren't so aware of that work, um, uh, I guess now it's weird, I think it was two years ago. <laughs> but, um, it was. Yeah, I made a piece for New York City Ballet called The Runaway that, um, uh, where I was, I was really playing with a couple different um, musical ideas. I, I worked with uh, music by Nico Muley and with music by Kanye West and James Blake. Um, and I think part of a lot of, I guess, yeah, part of what that work is, um, thinking musically, was about expectation um, and stereotype in some ways. People don't know that I have a history in classical music. I grew up playing uh, a lot of different classical instruments growing up in my life. Um, but I think there's this thought, okay, well, he's a black choreographer, of course he's going to use hip hop. And then I thought to myself, well, what if I actually do want to use hip hop? <laughs> like, so I, I was kind of like dealing with that. Like, what do I want to do? What do I need to prove? Not that I need to ideally prove anything to anyone but myself, but I did feel that challenge. And I think that challenge I wanted to tell in a way that um, evoked an abstract narrative for myself um, that is actually dealing with something else that I never share with anyone. Oh, secrets. Um, but, uh, tune in yeah. next week. What's that? So tune in next week. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, for the moment, it's really just a thing where um, I was addressing those fears and expectations that I was dealing with. Uh, I think that's what kind of led to that music. Um, and also talking to my collaborators. Um, the way I work, I really love talking to the people that I'm working with in the room to get a sense of um, what they want, um, what what their impressions are of the work. Um, talking to Dan Scully, who's been my lighting designer since 2004, um, showing him the work when it was all to classical music, and then showing him a section that I had made to the Kanye music, and hearing his response was like, oh yeah, I guess I better should, I, I should probably um, spend more time on the Kanye. So. Uh, there's that, and then some of the dancers in the company and rehearsal directors as well, kind of telling me that they really loved that direction, really helped me to push myself to go there. There was uh, the James Blake section that comes in at the end actually didn't exist until the week before, the week of the show. There was a whole other section that was like maybe six or seven minutes long that I cut, and in place I added a whole brand new section to a different with a different artist on it. And you seem to make those kind of changes pretty pretty readily toward toward towards the end. Um, you know, I'm I'm thinking back to um, the moment that I walked into our theater after you know a week and a half of seeing it, and all of a sudden all the projection was there. Yeah, I mean more than that, we made a we made a seven and a half minute section at purchase in two days. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> 
Right. Well, that, well, that's what, you know, the, the way we've been working a Fords, right? I mean, you were with us for, what, almost three weeks? Yeah, you get time to kind of just, um, not only to feel comfortable enough to kind of take different types of risks and to ask questions. I think that's the one thing that people don't realize when you um, aren't given a technical residency or the power of a technical residency. You can see the work um, like lit up and everything and then have someone like Charlotte Brathwaite or Risa Steinberg come in as um, different collaborators of mine and give me the feedback and just say, you know, I feel like there's more. I feel like you can push Dan more. Dan is like uh, such an amazing uh, collaborator of mine doing lighting and scenic design. Um, and I think he felt it too. Um, and I think because there's so much trust sometimes, I'm like, oh yeah, Dan, I'm sure whatever the final product will be, it'll be great. <laughs> I just like leaving too. Um, but it was, yeah, some of that push that got us to where we, where we got to by the end of that um, residency and performance. And when you do a residency, um, I know certainly a purchase, you know, you really are one of the best about sharing your time so that you're, you're doing your work, but then you're also in rooms with our students, giving master classes and talks like this and, you know, all kinds of rich opportunities for them. Um, are, are those two very separate activities in your mind or do things happen sometimes with the students that maybe influence what you then go back to? Um, I think it's kind of like an all of the above. I think it depends on the project um, and the timeline, really. I think we got stuck with a um, snowstorm um, yeah. in the beginning of our residency. I think that day in particular was a day for us to really be engaging with the, the students in the conservatory. Um, so yeah, I think it, it depends. I think there's always more that I, I want to do. Um, it also depends on yeah, where I'm at with the project. Um, maybe there's a lot of technical aspects that really need to be sorted out and, um, and um, experimented with. In other cases, the aspect of just humanity and talking to people about their experience separate from anything that has to do with on stage finds its way to the stage. So making the space to do that is, is also important. Um, but it's also, it's also important for me to just know who, like where, where, where are we and who are the people in this community that we are um, going to um, share ourselves with. Awesome, thank you. Um, so this one uh, comes from one of the students. Um, so they're asking about, um, assume, assuming that the AIM dancers all come from a variety of disciplines and diverse training backgrounds. Um, what has it been like finding a balance between different styles of dance between the dancers, between some being more classically trained, some being more contemporary trained, some maybe coming from hip hop and so on? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I was talking to the dancers about something similar um, just what's today, today's Tuesday, last yeah, week. Today is Tuesday. Yeah, just uh, on Friday about what, you know, I'm often asked the question of like, what do I look for in a dancer? And I think the bigger thing for me is, it used to just be an openness, an openness to like learn new things. But now there's so many more, <laughs> so many more factors to that nowadays. <laughs> but um, I, I was telling them, I said, I don't want to think of you all as food, but if you are thinking about like a meal, you think about like, you know, maybe, um, maybe like a really thoughtful curry or gumbo, you think about like all the layers of seasoning. I don't want anything to be super like um, overpowering, but I need to think about what, what's missing in, in that palate. Um, or is like every bit of your taste buds being satiated in some way. Um, and that's kind of how I look at, um, how I'm looking at bringing new people into the company as part of it. Um, what's missing there's some dancers that are great at um replicating the steps exactly the way i do them and there's some that are great at generating material um and some that aren't and there's some that um don't do it at all like me but i'm like that is so interesting and unique that like i really need to bring that in um, but one of the things that brings us together ideally is the ways in which we go about um having we have um like company class periodically uh, with different artists that uh, whose work either influences what I do or work that uh, or, or they do the work that um, I want to influence my dancers. Mm -hmm. um, so I bring in, I've brought in guest teachers. Sometimes it's people from Cunningham, but it's people uh, in particular that I think are like really daring uh, in the way they approach the technique, um, like Silas Reiner or um, uh, Melissa Too Good. Um, there are two more teachers that we've had come in. There's a whole host of others. 
Uh, we have Jody Meldick come in and teach a release-based class. Um, we have Oliver Steele come in. You know, Oliver's in that in that lineage of Kevin Wynn, who yeah. is a huge idol of mine. And um, uh, you know, he wouldn't call himself a mentor of mine, but I would. <laughs> um, I've looked up to him since I first saw his work um, at the spring concert uh, that purchases 25th anniversary. Um, and I've been a huge fan and admirer of him, him and his work ever since. Um, we bring in ballet teachers who studied with this woman, Maggie Black. There's a certain sensitivity to the technique that I really find um, really useful for modern dancers uh, and ballet dancers, of course, as well, but for the dancers I work with, um, that is really important. So all bringing those elements together, I think, helps us to kind of come together. Um, but I don't need people to necessarily look alike. Um, it's yeah. nice if we um, are coming to the work with a humility and um, an openness to kind of try and find uh, my nuance in some way. Um, but even with that, bringing in new information that will inspire me and inspire them as well. That's great, thank you. Um, so I have a few uh, college education and purchase specific questions um, as, we, as we wind towards the, the end of our time already. Um, so, uh, one of our respondents, um, wanted to know, many dancers choose to forego a college education while dancing professionally, yet you chose to pursue not only a BFA, but an MFA and doctorate degrees. Um, so where do you rank, uh, the importance of education for aspiring dancers? Uh, it's number one, <laughs> uh, co college, college is so much more than the, than the way in which people perceive uh, classroom learning. Um, I, I guess I should have put the quotes on classroom. Um, but um, dancers that I've experienced working with in some way who didn't finish um, college, who like maybe they went for a year or two and they left, or they left even three years in, there, to be really honest, there's a, the element of humility that sometimes is lacking. I think there's something that happens in the college um, in the, that four years, if it takes four years, five years, however many years for you, where you kind of sometimes have to be broken down. Um, you, you're not going to win at everything all the time. Um, so it's just kind of like pushing past that, that adversity and acknowledging where you could improve, should improve, and a level of respect for your elders that I, that I think colleges and universities really help set up, and for your peers. Um, I, I, I mean, I, everyone, anyone who knows me knows how much I loved my time at Purchase in particular, but um, yeah, there's, there's just something about responsibility and professionalism that you get when you actually finish that time um, that needs to really kind of be taken into consideration all the more. Um, there are dancers that I met who are outstanding who didn't go to, to college, but they actually didn't last in the company. Um, I don't know. Maybe there, I'm sure there are other reasons there. Um, but in every instance that I can think of, um, there's, there's always been something that um, maybe, maybe interferes with those dancers um, reaching their fullest potential because, in my mind, uh, they didn't get past that last hurdle um, that a college and university setting can, can bring. Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, and, you know, I, I think it, it, it comes, you know, you can look at it from a lot of angles. For my, my own story, you know, I didn't end up being, you know, the actor I necessarily thought I was going to be, but I wouldn't be in the arts at all if I hadn't gone to college for acting. So you find it, there's also, you find a different path. So, so jumping off that, um, someone wanted to know um, what parts of your dance career, um, or maybe another way to ask this is, you know, what are things um, that you can attribute to your time studying at Purchase that you still use regularly? Time studying, I mean, <laughs> everything. Um, oh, geez. Good answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I really drank the Kool-Aid. It's, um, it's hard to say. I mean, I had only debt. I hadn't studied dance but so much before I got to purchase, um, and I don't know if I would feel differently otherwise, but um, I just soaked everything in. There's some things that maybe took a little longer for me to get, um, and there's some things that were challenging and still are challenging. I mean, Cunningham technique is not something that has ever really been easy for me, but it doesn't mean I don't love it, um, or I don't, um, 
I'm not inspired by the challenges that that technique um, brings to me. Um, Graham uh, is a technique um, that has so much imagery kind of just innately connected to the way in which you are approaching that uh, musicality and movement that will always be with me. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, Betty Jane Seals was my, one of my favorite ballet teachers that I had there. Um, I, I owe a lot of like the way in which I think about Porter brought to her. I, I mean, I just also just loved her. Uh, I love her still. Um, yeah, I mean, there's other teachers. Some have passed on. Gail Young was one of my ballet teachers at Purchase who um, just believed in me. Um, I didn't have much ballet technique at all. And when I entered the school uh, and or auditioned for the school, they told me that I really had to work on my ballet and um, I wasn't even allowed to pick my electives. Uh, I had to take a ballet tutorial class that uh, only had maybe three other students in it. But it was having a teacher like Gail who would just bring me into his office and just tell me that he saw something in me and believed in me regardless of my low level in a certain technique. It, it spoke to me in a way that said that like, it's not about levels. Um, it's about artistry and it's about your heart and your passion. And so I guess maybe that's more the thing that, that sticks with me and, and um, stuck with me for, for my time at Purchase. That's great. That's a beautiful answer. So another question from a student, um, uh, very similar to the ones we get when, when we're in person in the room. So I feel a little at home with this one. Um, they want to know what mistake most college-age dancers make that hurt their chances of getting placed with a company um, and also um, what sort of internship and education programs might be uh, offered via AIM. Sure, yeah, well, those, are, those are big questions. Um, I thought you were going to say, can you do the splits? I thought so. <laughs> well, it's uh, usually a variable on how do I get into your company, which I think right, you should right. want to know. So. Yeah, I mean, humility is a big part of that, honestly, um, and openness. I, I, I've, I've been learning a lot through the years about the people that I brought into the space, um, and I really want to make sure that they are really solid, good human beings, um, aside from being talented artists. Um, but yeah, that's a big puzzle piece, just that humility and openness um, and seeing how you um, can converse. I really want people to not only be able to use their bodies to communicate, I want to hear them. I want to hear what they think. I want to know how it feels being in the movement because these days I'm not really dancing much. So if I'm putting a work on a company or on dancers, I really need to know what that material, what that movement feels like for them. So there's that. And then in terms of um, internships and things like that, um, that information is always on our website, um, abrahaminmotion.org. Um, we try and think about summer internships and things like that. Um, apprenticeships are, that's a thing that I really take um, in a specific way because I, I apprenticed for a company uh, once in my life and had a really precarious relationship with what that meant, um, especially in the early aughts and late 90s. Um, I think it was a different time for um, choreographers and directors to use that term, apprentice, um, without really thinking about how, like, uh, the dancer's livelihood in some ways. So we don't do that, but we have um, a role that we have, uh, we call the swing, swing performer. So they're dancers who, um, ideally are strong enough, um, they have to be strong enough to go in and perform if anything were to happen. Um, but they're also on a bit of a um, timeline. Um, in some cases, those uh, swings join the company. In other cases, they don't. Um, it's not uh, guaranteed, but it gives me more time to get to know that dancer and to see how they work and um, what our connection is. Great, Kyle, thank you. So before I go to the final question, um, I did promise one of our great patrons, uh, Miss Pat Jacobs, that we would send love to Tamisha. So. Oh, yes. <laughs> so let's, over the airwaves, please send love to Tamisha. Um, yes. And everyone, all the dancers. Um, today. Online, of course. <laughs> So this last question um, is about um, the, uh, the, the performance in December. So this past December, um, I think most of our audience knows that we had the Avant premiere of your Untitled Love, the piece we were talking about earlier today. Um, and I think most of our audience has seen that we tend to go on a journey with an artist. So, you know, we had you first two years ago and then building to this. We've seen Victor Quijada a few times building to his premiere and so on and so forth. So the question is, um, 
throughout this process, how has your company's relationship um, with the PAC audiences changed? Um, oh, it's hard to say, especially with the show being in December. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I definitely can say that I saw um, people that I hadn't seen before um, in the audience. Um, it's always, yeah, it's always a tricky thing, especially I think when you're um, presenting work uh, during a time when students are either just about to go home or all those things. So you don't, it's a hard time to really gauge um, the shifts and changes from time to time. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's a little hard to, you know, it's a little hard to gauge that time. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an evolving thing, but I think it's important to point out that you said that you saw a lot of people you hadn't seen before in the audience, because that's what we were up to uh, before all this started, and certainly that's what we're going to get up to um, as, soon as, uh, as soon as this pandemic behind us. Nice. It will be very soon. Um, is there anything else you want to add or anything else we should know about what you're doing? Uh, nothing comes up at the moment. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, of course, always grateful. I'm grateful for everything you, you do, Seth, um, to kind of advocate for the artists and for the students at the college and university. So, um, yeah, super grateful. Um, but well, nothing to really just add for adding sake. <laughs> great. Well, and of course, we're grateful for our partnership with you and your time today. Um, you know, we miss doing this. So this was heartening for me, and I'm sure it'll be heartening for our students and our audience members that. Uh, that get to watch this. So thanks so much, Kyle. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll let you get back to your good work. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thanks All so right. much. All right. See you.